Hello, uh, this is Professor Dean Mead, and this lecture is part of Unit 1 of Advanced Topics in Governmental Accounting, addressing accounting and financial reporting for post-employment benefits. So what we're trying to do with this lecture here uh, in the second week of the uh, course is to give you the background you need on uh, the pension and other post-employment benefit, or OPEB, standards uh, that the GASB has promulgated, what the requirements are of those standards, uh, some understanding of why uh, the standards require what they do, why there were changes from the prior standards, uh, and also along the way to share some basic analytical tools with you uh, that are used to assess the health of a pension or OPEB plan and which you will need for uh, the assignment, uh, the first assignment in the course. So I'll begin by talking about certain terminology that I want to make sure everyone understands uh, and that is relevant to determining what parts of the standards that a government is required to apply. Uh, we'll talk about the basic approach to measuring the liability, which hasn't changed. It's just the standards around that approach to measuring the liability that have changed. Uh, and also what is required to be reported. Uh, I'll go through the requirements of the pension and OPEB statements uh, and what governments in different types of plans are required to do. And then at the very end, uh, give you a, a very quick uh, primer on how to calculate percentage change, which is something that you're going to need for that first assignment of the semester. So let's begin with the language uh, of the accounting standards in certain terms that you uh, need to understand. When we're talking about post-employment benefits, uh, as GASB refers to them, we're, we're talking about pensions and OPEB uh, that a, uh, an employee receives after they have left the employment of the government, and it's part of the total compensation for the service they provide to the government. Uh, so some of their compensation uh, is salary, uh, health insurance, and uh, other benefits that they receive as they're working. And then post-employment benefits are deferred compensation that they receive after they have left the employment of the government, generally when they have retired. Pension benefits are, you know, the provision of an income stream uh, in the future based on a formula that often includes things like the amount of uh, pay that the employee was receiving at the time that they retired or an average of the last several years uh, of their salary, uh, as well as the number of years that they worked uh, and certain other assumptions. OPEB is everything else, everything other than pension benefits. Primarily, we're talking about retiree health insurance but it also includes any other type of uh, benefit, such as legal services, uh, life insurance, that is provided separately from a pension plan. There are generally two types of uh, pension and OPEB plans uh, that are relevant to the accounting standards. Defined contribution plans are those in which the amount that the government has to contribute is specified in the terms of the plan, and that contribution is made to an individual employee account. So it's not a contribution made to a plan, uh, a retirement system or something like that, but the government is contributing to the individual investment accounts of each employee. And the benefits that the employee receives uh, when he or she retires in the future is dependent entirely on how much is contributed both by the government and perhaps by themselves and the earnings on those contributions when they're invested. Uh, so the government doesn't have any additional obligation or liability to these employees beyond the requirement to contribute each year into their account. The accounting for defined contribution uh, pensions and OPEB we're not going to talk about uh, in this lecture because it's very straightforward. You're, the focus is on the contributions that the government is required to make. When they make the contributions, 
there's an outflow of resources, there's an expense and an expenditure that's being reported. If payment is normally due and payable uh, and they haven't yet made it, then they've got a liability, a payable that they need to report. Uh, but uh, there's very, uh, you know, little other reporting besides that. Uh, some note disclosures that explain the nature of the plan uh, and the contribution amount for the period, but otherwise, when we're talking about pension and OPEB reporting, the big deal is not the DC plan, the defined contribution plan, it's the DB plans, the defined benefit plans. So that, from an accounting perspective, is any plan that doesn't meet all three of the criteria for being a defined contribution plan. But as you and I understand them, we're talking about plans in which the government has promised that it's going to provide a certain level of benefit in the future when the employee is no longer working for the government. And therefore, the government has a liability to that employee in the amount of uh, those benefits that the employee is ultimately going to receive. Another key distinction uh, uh, among types of plans is how many plans, how many employers are involved in the plan, and that affects some of the information uh, that, uh, particularly with respect to disclosures and supporting information that a, a government is required to present. A single employer plan includes just one financial reporting entity, so a primary government and its component units. Whereas an, uh, uh, an, a multiple employer plan includes more than one financial reporting entity, uh, often lots of them uh, in some states, uh, you know, could be hundreds or, th or, or even, uh, you know, thousands uh, of, uh, of local participating governments. Uh, in an agent multiple employer plan, uh, each employer's contributions uh, are you know, generally pooled for investment purposes, so they put all the money together uh, because they can, uh, you know, generally get much better returns by uh, investing that larger amount together than they would if they had to uh, invest it individually and separately from one another. Uh, and you also have economies of scale from a single administrative uh, umbrella over the uh, uh, the plan, but separate accounts are kept for each employer and the benefits that are paid to that employer's retirees come out of that employer's account only. Um, essentially, this is like a bunch of single employer plans that are all bundled together under one roof. The big difference uh, in terms of type that affects the standards is if a government is in a cost-sharing multiple employer plan. So, like an agent multiple employer plan, there's more than one uh, financial reporting entity in the plan. And again, often hundreds or thousands of them. Uh, and not only do they pool together the contributions for investment purposes, but the benefit payments are made out of that common pool of assets. There are no separate accounts kept for each of the uh, participating employers. It's important to understand how GASB looks at the substance of the transaction that's taking place here between employer and employee because it affects some of the provisions of the uh, accounting standards that the GASB uh, has developed. GASB views the, the pension and OPEB transaction uh, as a, a career-long transaction, so uh, not a new transaction that takes place each year. Like this year, the employee works and gets pension and OPEB benefits. Next year, they work and they get more. Year after that, they work and they get more. The way the GASB looks at it, uh, and this has a lot to do with the longevity of careers in government, where people tend to work for government, maybe not one government, but you know, uh, two or three or four governments for their entire career. And often, uh, if uh, the governments they're working for are nearby one another, they very well may participate in the same pension plan. So there's not even an issue of portability there. 
you know, from one pension plan to another. They're, they're working for a different government, but they're still in the same pension plan. Uh, so this affects some of the, the provisions of the accounting standards because we're looking at this extended transaction over time rather than individual discrete transactions in each year of the employee's uh, service to the employer. Another key part uh, of the accounting here is the, the emphasis in governmental accounting on measuring cost of service. So it's important uh, to be able to calculate how much benefits cost each year, regardless of whether the government is actually making a contribution equivalent to that cost. Uh, and in fact, now under these standards, you know, the approach to funding, uh, setting aside money for uh, pension or OPEB benefits is completely separate from the approach that's taken to accounting for them uh, in generally accepted accounting principles based financial statements. Uh, the, the focus here should be on, uh, you know, an accounting measure of the size of the liability and what it costs each year uh, to taxpayers. Uh, so that that folds into the measure of the overall cost of services and, and, and not on you know, how a government approaches putting money aside, which may uh, and usually is uh, an amount that's very different from what the, the expense is for any given period. So let's talk about how the liability for pensions or OPEB is measured, because th this is something that hasn't changed under the standards that are in place now. Uh, it's based on an actuarial valuation, calculations done by an actuary, uh, and, uh, uh, and that same measurement procedure hasn't changed. Uh, what is different in the new standards, and I'll mention some more about this later, is the fact that uh, some of the assumptions and methods that can be used uh, are narrower uh, than they were which improves the comparability of the resulting information if uh, everybody is using basically the same set of assumptions uh, and uh, and methods uh, then there's you know much better comparability of their liabilities and expenses and other information now we don't require at the GASB uh, everybody use the same assumptions but there is a fairly tight set of parameters around what they can assume uh, and what methods they can use and that that significantly improves the comparability of the information. Essentially, and I'm boiling down what is a complicated process in actuarial valuation, that process uh, involves three steps. Uh, the, the actuary is going to take the terms of the plan and uh, make certain assumptions about things like how long people are going to work and how long they're going to live uh, and uh, you know what economic factors that are relevant like inflation are going to be and they're going to project out into the future what the cash outflows are going to be for those pension and OPEB benefits and they're going to do it for every year until the very last beneficiary or member uh, draws their very last breath and therefore the very last payments are being made and that could in some instances be 90 or more years out into the future. Each of those annual projected benefit outflows then is going to be discounted to their actuarial present value, meaning what their value would be today using an assumed discount rate. Uh, then that present value is divided between past periods of service and future periods of service. And that amount that is allocated to past periods of service, that is the basis for the total liability the total pension liability, the total OPEB liability, what used to be called the actuarial accrued liability or AAL. It's the same you know, basic concept, that part that's related to service that has already been provided and benefits that have already been earned, that's the total liability, the amount allocated to past periods of service. So visually, let's look at what this is. You know, the actuary is looking at it for each employee a, a timeline with key events, uh, key points in time. Uh, they know when the employee was hired and, and how old they were. And at, at the present date, when they're 
doing the valuation how old they are so we know how long the employees worked. In this case, they've worked already for 15 years. Uh, they're, they're not numbers picked out of the air. They reflect actual experience uh, tempered to a certain degree by knowledge about things that are coming down the pike. Uh, so that's your service period then between when the employee was hired and when they are going to retire or otherwise leave the employment of the government. And that's the period over which the benefits are being earned. And the number of years they've worked, in this case, it's 37 years. Uh, that's usually a key component of the formula for determining the amount of benefits that an employee is going to receive when they retire. An assumption is also made about life expectancy, how long they're going to live after they retire and therefore how many years they're going to collect benefits. And in this case, you see the expectation is that their benefit period when they're receiving benefits is going to last for 18 years. So going back to that valuation process, the actuary is going to project benefits over that period between when the employee is expected to leave the employment of the government and when they're expected to die. So this is using a uh, an OPEB uh, uh, example and, and we'll say that the actuarial valuation determines uh, in doing their projections that the cost of these OPEB benefits at retirement will be $15,000. They're going to project the outflows for each year, each of these 18 years uh, of this benefit period, uh, and, you know, and and so that you have an amount that could be discounted to its present value. Now, normally, you wouldn't expect then the amount to get smaller because of, at a minimum, the effects of inflation. But one of the key things about retiree health insurance is that when the employee hits, uh, I think it's sixty-seven now, uh, they become eligible for uh, Medicaid. And uh, uh, and therefore, sorry, Medicare, uh, and and therefore that picks up a lot of their uh, insurance cost, and uh, the cost of the employer then declines uh, because they are responsible for less uh, of the retiree health insurance burden uh, than they were before the employee became eligible for Medicare. So each of those amounts uh, in the future then is discounted to its actuarial present value, the amount as of the date uh, that the valuation is being done. And then that actuarial present value, as I said before, is uh, allocated using a cost allocation method to past periods of service uh, and uh, to future periods of service. And that amount that's allocated to past periods of service is the basis for the total liability. So you can see it would be this part here, the allocated to the past periods of service that serves as the basis for the total liability. So now that we have this basic understanding of, of how the liability is measured, let's talk about what uh, the accounting standards require government to report. Uh, these uh, are the pronouncements that are relevant to uh, accounting uh, to accounting and reporting of uh, pensions and OPEB. Um, it actually, uh, now that I'm looking at this, I realize it doesn't include Statement 82 uh, on pension issues that addresses certain uh, issues that came up during the implementation of the pension standards, and it doesn't include Omnibus 2017, which is Statement 85, uh, that includes some pension and OPEB-related uh, uh, provisions that uh, addressed issues that came up during the implementation of those standards. Um, but the main focus uh, of this lecture is Statement 68, uh, which is reporting by employers uh, by governments for uh, 
uh, their benefits for pensions and Statement 75, which covers OPEB. Um, reporting by the plans themselves, if a plan uh, produces its free, uh, a freestanding uh, financial report, uh, is governed by Statement 67 on, uh, uh, on reporting by pension plans and Statement 74 for reporting by OPEB plans. The, one of the key issues in uh, the standards is whether the benefits are provided through a trust that meets certain criteria, and that affects what information uh, the government is going to report about its benefits. So those criteria are that contributions that are made to the trust by the employer uh, and by what's called a non-employer uh, contributing entity, and I'll mention it, you know, later what that means, uh, they're uh, irrevocable, or if you prefer, irrevocable. That means once they're contributed, the government or, or the other contributor cannot get them back. Um, the uh, assets that are in the plan are dedicated to providing pensions or OPEB, as the case may be, and those assets are legally protected from creditors of the government or other contributors to the plan. Um, notice I'm not mentioning the members of the plan because sometimes their contributions can come back. They sometimes get refunds. Uh, for instance, if they've been making contributions to the plan, but they, they leave the government before they vest, generally their contributions will be refunded to them. Uh, also, uh, it may be the case that uh, their benefits are not uh, legally protected from creditors. If they go through a divorce, for instance, uh, you know, the, their benefits may be divided between them and their former spouse. Uh, the standards apply not just to uh, the employer governments, but also, as I mentioned, these non-employer contributing entities. These are other entities that have a legal obligation to make contributions directly to the pension or OPEB plan. Uh, and if they meet certain criteria, that arrangement is called a special funding situation, and there are specific uh, accounting requirements that are related to that situation. Um, most of the time, those non-employer contributing entities are other governments. For instance, uh, there are some states that have uh, a legal obligation for making some or all of the contributions to pensions related to uh, teachers in local school systems. Michigan is uh, one of those states, for instance. Uh, in a defined benefit pension or OPEB uh, arrangement, uh, there are basically two types of liabilities that you're talking about. One is, uh, you know, a payable to the plan from the employer. So, uh, you know, a payment is normally due and payable, uh, you know, on a certain date, and the payment hasn't been made yet, so the employer has a payable to the plan. That's just a normal payable like any other. And that's not really what we're talking about when we're talking about the pension liability or the OPEB liability. The big deal that everybody is talking about is the liability to the employees. Uh, that is referred to as either the net pension liability, or NPL, uh, or the net OPEB liability, or NOL. Uh, that is equal to the total liability. Again, remember that's that amount of the actual present actuarial present value allocated to past periods of service. That total pension liability or total OPEB liability minus the assets in the plan, which are referred to as the plan's fiduciary net position. Uh, so, what you're looking at is the 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 total liability uh, as of a given date, you're subtracting the fair value of the assets of the pension or OPEB plan from it, and that gives you the net pension liability or net OPEB liability, and that amount is what, a, under the, the, the new standards, a government is required to recognize in their accrual-based financial statements. So they're going to recognize that liability on the face of the financial statements, and that's perhaps the most significant change in these standards. That prior to this, the standards required governments to measure the liability and to disclose it in the notes, but not to recognize it on the face of the financial statements. Uh, you know, one of the, the key reasons why that is now required uh, 
uh, is that in the interim between the prior standards for pension statement 27, for OPEB statement 45, is the, the GASB continued to work on its conceptual framework, including the issuance of concept statement number four, elements of financial statements, which includes definitions of assets, liabilities, inflows of resources, outflows of resources, deferred inflows of resources, deferred outflows of resources, and net position. Uh, and so when the board uh, re-examined the existing pension and OPEB standards, uh, in, in order to consider whether improvements needed to be made. One of the things they did was they looked at this liability in light of that conceptual framework definition uh, of a liability and determined that these were uh, obligations that met the definition of a liability. They were measurable with sufficient reliability and therefore should be, should be recognized on the face of the financial statements and not just disclosed in the notes. Uh, governments that are in single or agent employer pension or OPEB plans recognize the entire amount of the net pension liability or net OPEB liability. But if a government uh, is in a cost sharing plan or if it uh, is a non-employer contributing entity or uh, an employer that benefits from having a non-employer contributing entity contribute to its pension plan, then it's going to recognize a proportionate share of the net pension liability and the net OPEB liability. So it's going to recognize some but not all of that liability because there will be another government or uh, the, uh, the non-employer contributing entity that's recognizing the remainder of it in their financial statements. The other possibility here is that the pension or OPEB is not provided through a trust that meets the criteria. Uh, this happens relatively rarely for pensions, but it's very common for OPEB. Uh, in fact, it's, it's the exception rather than the rule that OPEB is provided through a trust that meets those criteria and that the government is actually setting money aside for uh, those OPEB benefits. They have traditionally been financed on a pay-as-you-go basis, uh, and, and relatively few governments have a trust that contains assets that offset the total liability. So in this instance, the government is going to report the total pension liability or the total OPEB liability because there is no fiduciary net position to offset it. The um, measurement date, which is the date as of which the liability, the total liability is being measured, can be as early as one year prior to the date of the financial statements. Uh, and the reason for this is, is really twofold. One is uh, that governments don't always have the same fiscal year as their pension plan, particularly if they're participating in a multiple employer plan, uh, which in a lot of cases is being administered by the state. Uh, and the state may have a different fiscal year end. The plan may have a different fiscal year end. Uh, and so when the plan is doing its actuarial evaluations may not time well uh, with when uh, the government is doing them, uh, when the government is reporting its financial statements. Uh, and, and that relates to the second reason, which is that the board was concerned that if they required the measurement to be done as of the same date of the financial statements, that, you know, measuring as of that date may, might have lengthened the time uh, that it takes to get those financial reports out. And as you already know, that's already a big issue, timeliness of financial reporting for governments, because governments tend to take about six months to issue their gap-based financial reports. And that's, you know, in the analytical world, an extraordinarily long period, especially when you look at publicly traded companies that are required to get theirs out uh, on a quarterly basis within 45 days. You know, taking six months to get one annual report with no interim quarterly reporting done uh, seems, you know, to, to not be nearly as, uh, as useful to the people who need that information. So that measurement date can be as early as a year before. Based on the experience with the pension standards, most governments took that full year. The measurement then is based on an actuarial valuation that can be, as of a date, 
as early as 30 months in a day prior to the date of the financial statements. Again, my observation has been that it, it, it almost never is that long, in part because the valuations have to be done at least every two years. And for plans of any size whatsoever, they almost always are doing the valuations every year. Uh, so more often than not, what you were seeing was either an actuarial valuation on the same date as the measurement date, or maybe a year, uh, up to a year prior to that. Uh, one thing the standards also require is they, they're not just saying you, you have this offset, you know, in order to make the measurement easier to do uh, and, and to ensure that your information is in there, uh, you know, and, and just that's it. And it can be, you know, a, a little bit stale. The standards are saying uh, as well that if there are significant changes that take place between the actuarial valuation and the measurement, uh, that those need to be reflected in the measurement of the liability. And so a government will do what is called either updating procedures or roll forward procedures uh, in order to take those changes into account. So compared with the old standards, which, uh, you know, in, in, uh, under which the, the measurement could have been as much as three years prior to the end of the fiscal year with no updating whatsoever. Uh, this is significantly fresher information uh, about the liability uh, and, and the other information about pensions and OPEB than uh, users of financial statements were getting in the past. This is a visual example of how uh, uh, the measurement might work. You have your fiscal year end that you're reporting on. The date of your financial statement is June 30th, 2018. Your measurement date can be as early as June 30th, 2017, which could, in the worst case scenario, be based on an evaluation as early as 1231, 2015. Uh, but as I said, with these updating procedures, for anything of significance that happens between the valuation date and the measurement date. And obviously the earlier the valuation date, the greater the likelihood that there is a need for updating procedures. And if the changes are so substantial or, you know, really just, you know, really, really significant, then the chances are that the government probably needs to do a more up-to-date valuation, um, not just doing updating or roll forward procedures. The methods and assumptions that go into the measurement uh, of the liability uh, are, uh, you know, still required to be uh, in conformity with actuarial standards of practice, unless the standards narrow them further. And there are several instances in which they do that. Uh, and you know, overall, you can see that there are fewer alternatives, and the parameters around the alternatives are narrower in the new standards than they were in the prior standards. What the, the, the standards don't do, what Statement 68 and Statement 75 did not do, was change how governments approach funding. Uh, the board's view is that that's a policy decision. And generally, people don't want the board involved in policy decisions. So the board has said, you approach funding however you want to approach funding. That's not our business. But when it comes to accounting for this and what you're going to report in your gap-based financial statements, that's the stuff that we have authority over. And so you're going to follow this approach, which is different from the way it used to be. But you go ahead and keep doing whatever you're doing on, on, uh, on your approach to funding. That's no longer our responsibility. Uh, and it never really was Gatsby's responsibility. But because the prior standards were based largely on how a government approached funding, there was a, a connection that was formed there that led a lot of people to think that funding had to follow GASB standards. In terms of what the standards require related to projection, it's based, as I said before, on the benefit terms and any agreements in place as of the measurement date. It includes all of the members of the plan, both active and inactive, and you know incorporates assumptions about things like salary progressions, how long people are going to work, that's what service credits are. For OPEB, it includes an assumption about health care inflation. Uh, if there are automatic post-employment benefit changes, such as cost of living adjustments or COLAs, those are included as well. Uh, what an automatic post-employment benefit change or automatic COLA is, uh, 
uh, is something that's written into the terms of the plan. So the plan says uh, every three years, for instance, an adjustment needs to be made to take into account inflation over the prior period. Uh, that's automatic. On the other hand, an ad hoc post-employment benefit change uh, is one that requires an additional action by the government uh, in order to grant that uh, that cost of living adjustment, for instance, it's not written into the terms of the plan. And generally, those are not included when you're projecting the benefit payments because they're not a part of the terms of the plan. However, the board was fully aware that in some cases, ad hoc COLAs happen with such regularity uh, and such frequency that they have effectively become automatic. And so what the standards say is that if these ad hoc post-employment benefit changes are effective or substantively automatic, they should be included in the projection as well. And that's a difference from the prior standards. Discounting uh, under the prior standards was based entirely on, for pensions on the long-term expected rate of return. And for OPEB, it was based on a weighted average discount rate uh, that uh, was part long-term expected rate of return and part general investment return on investments of the of the government employer uh, and the proportion in that weighting was generally based I, either on uh, the funded status of the plan so for instance if the plan was 50 percent funded meaning it had assets that were equal to 50 percent of the total liability uh, then uh, the government would uh, have a weighted average that was half long-term expected rate of return and half investment return on general assets of the general investments of the government. Um, because so few plans had any money in them at all, uh, that generally was not the approach. What was often the approach was to look at what contributions or payments were made for the year compared with the uh, required contribution, the annual required contribution, that was the basis for calculating pension uh, and OPEB expense under the old standards. So if they were contributing, again, an amount that was equal to 50% uh, of the annual required contribution, then that's the way they would weight the long-term expected rate of return and the general investment return uh, of the government. Uh, if it were uh, if they were contributing one-third of the annual required contribution, uh, then uh, the long-term expected rate of return would be one-third of the weighted discount rate and the general investment return of the, uh, uh, of the uh, employer uh, would be uh, two-thirds of that uh, weighted discount rate. Uh, under the new standards, the, the default still is the long-term expected rate of return on plan investments. However, that's tempered by the extent to which there actually are going to be resources in the plan in the future to make the projected benefit payments. Uh, and to the extent that they're not, uh, then some discounting will be done uh, using instead of the long-term expected rate of return, a municipal bond rate or index, uh, specifically one for 20-year tax-exempt general obligation municipal bonds that are rated AA or higher or their equivalent. So let me give you an example of how this would work. So what you're seeing here is a condensed version of uh, benefit projections that are showing uh, you know, we, we've removed 11 through 25 and, and years 31 through 95 so that it's readable. Uh, but you can see in this example, they're projecting 97 years out. Uh, and they're going to project, uh, here's the projection of the benefit payments for each of those years for this pension plan. And a projection of the fiduciary net position, what will be available in the plan based upon assumptions about investment returns, obviously, and also about contributions to the plan going forward. Now those assumptions have to be realistic so a government can't assume its way into always having enough money in the plan. Uh, they, the, the, what they're assuming about their contributions has to actually be based in reality. So they, if they've been contributing half of what was actuarially required, historically they can't, for this purpose, assume that they contribute 100%. So if you look at this, you can see that what they're doing is comparing uh, 
what's available in the plan and fiduciary net position and what the projected benefit payments are for each of those years. And up till this point, the amount of projected uh, fiduciary net position is larger than the projected benefit payments for that year. So the projected benefit payments for each of those years up to year 26, in this case, will be discounted using the long-term expected rate of return, which in this example is 7.5%. However, at this point, in year 27, the amount of projected assets in the plan, the fiduciary net position, is now smaller than the projected benefit payments. It's no longer sufficient to make those payments. Uh, uh, this is called the crossover point because this is the point at which you cross over from discounting using the long-term expected rate of return to discounting using the municipal bond rate. So from that point forward, the government is going to discount using, in this example, 4%. So that's considerably less than 7.5%. And as you know, uh, the smaller the discount rate, the larger the present value. And if the present value is larger, since that's the basis of the liability, the liability is going to be a lot bigger. So this same government, under the old standards, would have discounted all of the projected benefit payments using 7.5%. But now they're discounting just the first 26 years of projected benefit payments using 7.5%, and years 27 through 97 are being discounted using 4%. So their present value, their liability, would be considerably larger than it was under the previous standards. The present values that are discounted using these two separate discount rates are totaled. And then what the government is going to do is mathematically back into what single discount rate would have produced the same total, uh, uh, same total actuarial present value if it had been applied to every single period. So instead of discounting these periods using 7.5% and then everything after that at 4, what would the one rate, if it had been applied to every single period, what would that rate be to produce this same total present value? And in this case, that amount is 5.29%. It's referred to as the single discount rate, and that's something that will be important uh, as I come to talking about disclosures later.